Welcome back to Brothers and Boots. My name is Mike. This is Jeff. And today we'll be talking about horse leather. It's specific characteristics, some misconceptions with it, it's history, and just generally what makes horse leather unique. If you like this kind of content, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. We try our best to talk to every comment in the uh, comment section down below, especially if they have a question. And if your question is too long to answer in a comment format, maybe it'll become a Q&A video later on. Okay, so this will will include some history history and interesting factoids along the way. Um, biggest one that everybody talks about is shell or cordovan or shell cordovan. It traces its name back to seventh century Spain in the city of Cordoba, which was an early hub for tanning, apparently. If we go back about a hundred years from here, where we're at, Shell Cordovan, I'll just call it Shell, was actually most often used for razor strops, to hone and sharpen razor blades, which was a big, big need for barbers, but it was a need for everybody else as well. It, Felt like they needed a sharp blade all the time. I know that my father has always had one, and we'd spend an evening every once in a while down there sharpening up our various blades on it. Didn't really mean too much to me at the time that he was explaining it to me, but now it means a whole lot more to me. Um, since then, it's become, obviously, as we know it, to be used for a lot of high-quality footwear. It's loved more for its, its shine and its ability to kind of shine itself, self-shine with wear. Heals its own wounds as a part of that process because shell cordovan is a very fibrous structure. Um, and the reason it appears different colors and different lights is as we get into talking about how it's actually tanned and made, you'll find that it's actually really a waxed flesh with thousands of little fibers plenished very smooth. So that's why brushing takes scratches out because you're redistributing those fibers and removing the scratch because it's just like scratching rough out at that point. A little bit of a suede brush and the rough out scratch is gone. And it also conditions it. Doesn't wrinkle. Fibers. Instead, it kind of rolls, which is a preferred cool look as well. It is not found in all horses, or at least not very big. It depends on the horse. It's actually work horses that actually develop larger pieces of the shell. And for that reason, we don't it's it's not as available anymore it's one of the reasons for the, the high price that we see for it is because it's you know the horses that we see at the races or that somebody is going to ride every weekend they actually don't develop much of a shell it's the horses that are actually being used for work that we have mostly replaced with vehicles with, you know motors and whatnot and to top that off, so there's something called the Italian Leather Consortium, and the Italian Leather Consortium has lots of very strict rules on how horse or other forms of vaqueta leather are harvested, and horse is one of those that is under the um, guidelines of it can only be tanned, like you can't kill a horse for leather. It can only be tanned if it died of natural causes or it was consumed for meat. It has to be a byproduct of another ethical industry. The Italian Leather Consortium has been around 700 years. You don't want to get on the bad side of these guys. They will put you out of business. As Americans, I, I maybe improperly assume that a lot of viewers are, we don't really eat much horse. At least I don't know anybody who eats horse. I don't hear about people eating horse, but I... In Japan, I, th I think they eat quite a bit of horse. There's a lot of a areas in Asia where they eat quite a bit of horse. They also use mules, which mules do produce, produce what is considered horse hide, 
and also shell quarter mule is actually unique because it's one of the few that you can get a single piece short cut of shell quarter of a belt out of so in an area we'll talk about later called the strip a mule can actually develop the shell through the entire strip um and so in the mountainous areas especially in asia where we get a lot of horse hides from you find the use of mules especially since you know yeah we have motors but they might not be practical for one reason or another has greatly kept the ability to to get horse leather uh propped up more so than it would have been without or the re for some of those reasons that we just mentioned i have seen it read i don't know if it's still true uh, or if the article that I read was true, but I've I've read a few articles that say about 60% of the hides, the horse hides that we use in America actually come from overseas, usually from Asia. So that's a that's a pretty big number that we're importing. I like say a major place like Horween, which might be the only domestic that is doing show I think so at this point I can't off the top of my head think of anybody else that's doing it um, that's not Italian or Japanese at this point um, yeah I think so yeah I can't think of anybody else that does even even like standard horse hide. I don't even know if anybody else does horse that I can. I know Tasman at one point did, but Tasman's been out of business since 2020. Um, Galoon, Galoon, whatever in Milwaukee. Well, they've started doing horse rump recently, but if you look at their website, the majority of their stuff is, is European calf. So yeah. I, that's something they've recently started doing, but I... You know, like it's definitely not especially. That's definitely a brand new tan, like brand new process they're picking up. And they're also doing it in a very unique way with uh, uh, pickling it instead of, uh, uh, like, they pickle the hides first and, and, and that pickle juice instead of a, a more traditional tanning process. It's, a little, it's just a little bit different. I mean, once again, it still leads down the same veg tan path, but it's a little different than how everybody else does it. The shell is not actually the horse's skin. It is, a, it is something that lies beneath skin it's connective tissue membrane but it's it's something that's connected but lies beneath if you want to think about it except in a, for a logical perspective right so if you were to uh, phil from ashland leather did a really good breakdown of this if you want to think about it as like a three-tier sandwich right so layer one is the grain they shave that off layer two is the shell that's what's left and then layer three that they shave off the bottom is the flesh side or the fuzzy bits that you'd see in a rough out so essentially they take the suede cut out they take the grain out and you're left with that area that's in between the top grain of the leather but some of it's still there and the suede cut and that's what the shell cordovan is it's one of the reasons why horse rump is usually over seven seven and a half ounces is because they're taking an ounce to an ounce and a half off the top an ounce to an ounce and a half off the bottom and that shell's left at usually the four to four and a half ounce mark which is where you get around that seven and it could be as thick as nine ounces with the exception that mike mentioned uh with with the mules it's it's generally two round pieces it exists basically in the middle of the horse's butt cheeks. <laughs> you got middle of butt cheek number one and middle of butt cheek number two. Where is that? That's going to get pulled from. Like I said, it's it's most prominent in a, in a working horse. Um, Especially due to size, right? So it it's a flexibility thing that protects that region as the horse moves and works but obviously the smaller and leaner the horse is the less that's going to be there that's why like your big burly working horses i can't remember the name i think it's called an irish drought is the real big one that most people know um for like pulling plows and stuff and these are like huge like 1400 pound horses they're, they're one of the like top five biggest horse breeds that's going to be a horse where you're going to see lots of very large shell cordovan pieces and and these things range a lot so the smallest you'll see is usually well what they call one dm 
or 0.8 DS, and that's square meter and square foot depending on which one you, you go through. So Horween doesn't really do them in their DS measurements. They call them small, medium, large, extra large, so on and so forth, but everybody else does them by their DM metric measurement. And usually you don't go below 0.8, which is going to be about yay so big of a shell. And a lot of times that's not even going to get made into shell cordovan. That's more than likely to get made into just regular horse rump. Um, to as big as, you know, somewhere around this length here, where it's the entire size of a human torso, which is obviously going to come from a very large horse. It's not going to come from a small horse. Oh, uh, as I said, the, uh, the shell comes from the rump area. So when you, a lot, a lot of times we talk about horse rump, if if you've harvested the shell out of it, there's there's nothing useful left. You're you're not you can't get any rump. Meaning to explain it differently, if you buy rump, actually got the shell in it. It might be not it might be a small shell. It's probably a shell that's not worth very much. The the usually the only way that you're getting a rump is if the tannery looked at it and decided there's not enough of a shell here to pull out there's we don't want to screw with it let's just make it as a as a, as a rump instead so when you when you separate it you don't have the rump um that's and that's part of the area of confusion for a lot of people not understanding that relationship and where it comes from, but we'll expand more on that in a moment. Moving on to a different area, do you want to explain exactly how shell is made? Yeah, Start sure. to finish, the tannering and the finishing? Yep. So what happens is, is they start with the rump, and they harvest the shells out of it, right? So they, they find all the berries of the shells, they cut it out of the rump, and what's left is a little bit of horse strip. You have horse strip going this way, and you have horse strip going this way down the spine to the shoulder. Once those two shells are out, uh, this tanning process starts. They start by the initial phase of tanning that, getting it to a point that they can shave the top grain off, and then they can shave the flesh side or the suede cut off as well, and it's left with the shell. That will continue its tanning process for the next six months. Once that's complete, then from there, they can either, uh, they start the finishing phase. They can do what they call T-core tanning, which is where they're going to just dye the top layer and it can be scratched through. Or you can get struck through shell, where the shell is struck through pigment-wise all the way through. There's a couple reasons as to why you'd choose one versus the other. A lot of it comes down to if it's going to be a solid, what they call classic shell, and it tie to be classico, a marbled shell, a museum shell. Um, sometimes they call them graffiti shells where they use more than one color. That's just a, a, a um, marbled shell that is used in more than one color. It's what they call a graffiti shell. And once that part's complete and they've dyed it, at that point they go through the process of what's called jack glazing. Now jack glazing can involve multiple finishes that we pretty blanketly use the term jack glazing as just some kind of top coat that will allow the hide to be burnished. And then what they do is they take it and they use glass rods. Now some people use a... Um, like an old punishing hammer that has a glass rod attached to it like Shinky does. They have a video on their Instagram showing this where the glass rod slides back and forth and they just slide the shell back and forth through it like they're punishing an old fender. And that will take it from a very matte with just the finish applied phase to a super shiny burnish phase. And they do this a ton of times. Someone like Horween will run it through a machine like a hot iron where they emulsify stuff like Chrome XL and other like oil tanned and waxed products. The glass rods will be in a machine like that that burnish it through that way. And what it does is it, it burnishes thousands of times back and forth with this glass rod once whatever finish has been applied for the jack glazing and you get this super shiny product. And what's unique about that is, is because all that finish is still in it, even when you scratch it off, you can take a brush to it and brush back and forth and it will brush back to super shiny. And that's for two reasons. One, that six month tanning process has emulsified so many oils and conditioners into it that it naturally bleeds and blooms just like Chrome XL, its own conditioning. 
that's why shell could be taken care of with specifically just brushing for a long time. It'll eventually get to the point that you do need to add conditioners in, and it just depends on like what kind of state you like your shell cordovan in. Some people like it the way they got it, you're going to have to condition more often. Some people want it to be more natural. People have picked up 70-year-old pairs of Aldens and ain't been weared and brushed them back to looking normal. I, I mean, this stuff is a bit of, of a magic substance in that aspect. And on that note of Chrome XL, keep in mind, Chrome XL is derived from the shell process. They're literally doing what they do to shell cordovan for Chrome XL and just a much faster rate on cow, obviously, instead of horse. And like I said, once that shell is complete, it's air dried just like um, Chrome XL is. So obviously there's a little bit of shrinking that happens with that and you're left with the shell. They'll always be, it, it, the funny thing is, 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 you know, shells are rated in, in how many defects they have. Um, and people are like, well, my A grade shell, which is the top grade, has a hole in it. Yeah, it's the where the hook went into it for it to air dry. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, uh, the best quality shell quarterman will always have one hole in it the hole where it was hung from. So that's one thing you can't get away from. Because obviously you don't want like a clip or something pushing on it because then the finish is going to be screwed up there. You're going to be pushing die through. If it's a T-core, you've just pushed the die through to the, the not T-core side. And then that bleeds and, and spreads out and you're left with you know a non-desirable looking effect. So there's always going to be one hole in it. And that process, start to finish, takes about six months for tannage. It's about nine months, usually in general, to complete with the finishing process and everything. It's a very labor-intensive process. I mean, shell cordovan is expensive in combination of its rarity. The fact that not every horse rump has great shells. And on top of it, the intense process. Like, Horween's the longest at about nine months, but the rest of your Merriam, Chloe, uh, Shinky... Ogawa let, or Letter Ogawa. Um, I'm sure I'm missing at least one or two other ones in there. Um, I think Galuti does a little bit of Shell Cordovan too. They're in uh, Ricardo. That's what I was thinking of that I was missing. Um, they, they usually still are in the five to seven month mark. Like Shell Cordovan on average takes a minimum of six months. Some companies like uh, Merriam, Chloe, and. Uh, Ricardo, for example. So Ricardo shell only, so they get their shells from other people. Um, Letter Ogawa is the same way. They, they, it's not a hundred percent confirmed, but it's widely believed that they get most of their shells from Shinky, and they do the finishing, tanning, refinishing, so on and so forth process. Um, but you're like Merriam's, your Chloe's, they make way more horse rump than someone like Shinky does, and that's because those guys want very desirable. Um, Cordovan pieces that's proportionally shaped very good consistency throughout a maintained thickness shells be, or, or, are turned into horse rump from the, the main guys who make tons of horse rump for two specific reasons the shell's a weird size or it has lots of inconsistencies and in thickness and undesirable features in a shell uh, one that they feel like they could only dye it black a lot of times will become horse rump and you could see that if you flipped a horse rump over, see anybody hold it where it's got like lots of black around it. And then the nice core white in the center on the back shell side, the black isn't useful cordovan. So if the black ring that goes around it is real thick and gets wavy at the edges, oftentimes that becomes a horse rump instead. Whereas um, Shinky in recent years has decided they want to focus on cordovan the way Horween focuses on cordovan. And even some of the smaller shells that most of the other guys aren't even interested in wasting six months on become cordovan now and it's for things like wallets um patches a lot of stuff key fobs when we think of cordovan i mean probably the number one thing that's made out of cordovan is wallets and passport holders not really shoes um because even like a, a shell cordovan belt is usually put together in three pieces they'll they'll, they'll take three equal sized pieces split it and you know there'll be seams that you can see throughout it like alden when they make theirs they do like this kind of uh de lure style uh where they bring it to a tip like the centerpiece of the flit de lure you know the the thing that the saints have on their helmet um to kind of give it some uh, flair i guess whereas like ashland leather just does straight even sections because they like the look of that better I, neither one's right or wrong. Like I said, you get lucky, and sometimes, especially in mule, it can happen in horse. It's extremely rare. It's more likely in mule. You could get a one-piece shell cordovan belt. Obviously, a one-piece shell cordovan belt is going to go for way more money. The other thing, too, is there's no such thing as a pure shell cordovan belt. Obviously, it's going to have a veg tan backer. 
you cannot have a belt made out of four ounces. That's not a belt at that point. That's like, you know, those nylon belts you see people wearing that's like putting seat belts around them. <laughs> they got the plugs that have been stuff that are real popular these days. It'd be equivalent to that. It's not really a belt at that point. I, I mean, it's way too easy to stretch and slip off. It, 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 it's like so the elastic band in your sweatpants at that point. Like just heavy duty elastic band in your sweatpants. So they'll all almost exclusively be backed by a veg tan backer. I mean, I guess someone, if you really request it, could go super crazy and make you a thousand dollar belt and back it with natural shell cordovan too. But I don't think you're going to find too many people that are interested in that. Cause then they got to kind of like offset it to not have the seams in the same spots so that the seams don't bulge. So like your interior piece is going to be four segments instead of three and blah. Once again, no one's really going to do that. It's going to have a, just a single one piece natural veg tan backer. But that's kind of, you know, the specialty of Shell Cordovan. Because once again, you know, we mentioned it, it rolls, it doesn't wrinkle. That's one of the reasons people like it in belts. The other thing is, is, you know, belts a lot of times get scratches from taking stuff in and out of your pockets and your fingernails and stuff. Well, a Shell Cordovan belt, you can brush a ton of those scratches out real easy. And if the brush isn't getting them out, a little bit of, of Saphir or Venetian Shoe Cream, which is what... Uh, uh, Horween we... uses or anybody else's like shell cordovan creams, a couple different people make it. Just a little dab of that on there and brush it, and you'll take almost every bit of what you can see. I mean, it won't take dents out, obviously, but it'll take all the scratch marks and everything out. No problem. So, the other part of the hide that we have not talked about is the front horse front, double horse front, horse shoulder, etc. This part is it's still pretty thick yep. it it falls between the horse rump and the cordovan as far as the thickness because the horse rump would have the cordovan included um so, so but anyway it's still pretty thick uh usually about what Five, five and a half ounces. ounces. Yep. Sometimes as big as thick, six, but it, it's around that five, five and a half mark. And that's why traditional workwear boots are around five to five and a half ounce. Normally it's considered the true boot leather thickness. It's because before the 1950s, you know, the heritage area most of us, you know, base our boots off of, horse leather was the primary used leather. Like, like cow was nowhere near as common back then as horse was. And so you're, you're double. The reason it's called double horse front for anyone that's curious is the horse front is the front area of the horse with his shoulder and front legs. Um, just like a cow, you have a bend and a side, and a lot of times it's split down the middle. Well, because of the way uh, cordovan and horse rump works, the horse rump is technically the double rump. They cut it, you know, just before the hips, right? The d double horse front's the same thing. They just do the same thing with the shoulders. It, it's the exact same concept. So it'd be, it'd be both shoulders in one piece. Correct. Yep. Um, another bit of history uh, in Renaissance times, a lot of their armor would have been actually dried up horse front that they actually kind of turned into armor or they had better stuff to do it with. So this first part, this front part, the uh, shoulders, this is often just chrome tanned, but it can also be veg tanned. I don't know of any that are just doing a pure veg tan, but Darwin does do a fair amount of it using their CXL treatment, which is a combination of chrome tanning and veg tanning. It's From a, it's what a I understand, light chrome tan. So they they actually talked about this recently on the Full Grain podcast, which was a good which is a good uh, look into Chrome XL, is it lives its life as one day of chrome tan and the rest is all veg tan. So you get all the benefits of chrome tan in that first day and then you know the rest of the six weeks process is all about finishing and veg retanning it. From what I understand, Orwin does doesn't actually offer horse rump. Um, they probably would offer it if a customer specifically ordered a large amount of it but i don't think they offer horse rump at all I, I think they they separate the the shell all the time and if the shell is not big enough to 
really be used, that it would be pulled aside to be used for like wallets and keychains or any small thing that somebody might want to make with Shell. Yeah. No, I, I've never seen it offered for sale. I know at one point in time there was one group that did order horse rump and they've made it for them. They, they called it horse butt. They didn't call it horse rump. So it has been done at least once. But, you know, Horween is 100% made to order company. They don't make any stock. They don't run extras to sell. They, they do that more with, like, the Tannery Row, but that's of the, like, common stuff. Tannery Row ain't got extra shell Corbin sitting there. If you call the Tannery Row, it's like, I want to order six shells. You're getting six shells from the next batch in six to nine months, not, <laughs> not in the, the next week or two. Um, so because it's completely made to order now, I haven't seen anybody carry it. Um, I know it's been made once it was made to order. Now the flip side of that is, you know, why Horween's the best shell company, shell quarter of company in the world. Why would you want their horse rump over their shell? Especially when there's guys that do specialize in shell. So oh, this brings us to what the meat of the conversation, uh, the important part, if any of this is important, <laughs> which is what are the misunderstandings? What is it that people are confusing or not understanding or getting misled about? The biggest one would be that horse rump doesn't wrinkle. And that, of course, is a false. It, it can wrinkle. It depends on the part of the horse rump and the part of the boot. But the, the part that has the shell underneath it isn't going to wrinkle. At least I don't think it would wrinkle at all. It might provide some small little wrinkles. But generally speaking, the part with the shell underneath it isn't going to wrinkle. But that's not all of the rump. There's a fair amount of the rump there that does not have any shell underneath it. It is certainly going to wrinkle. Yep, I've got a picture to show. So That's false. These are my sh uh, Frank's natural shinky Wilshires. These are shinky horse rump. So if you look right here, the boot on the right, the vamp very clearly is got the shell cord of it in it. As you can see, it's got bumps, it's got rolls, there's no wrinkling to it. But when you look at the boot on the left, this vamp is very much not shell cord of it. You see the wrinkles. You see some of the kind of bumps and rolls a little bit, but obviously there's deep wrinkling here and here. It's not like cow wrinkling per se, but it has a deep wrinkle to it. It you know, acts more of how you would expect leather to look versus the boot on the right. This is the best example I could find. It happens to be my own pair of boots of where you can obviously see this came from the same rump. Obviously, my vamp on the right has shell and the one on the left doesn't, and it's pretty clear the difference between the two. Now, I do have another picture here to kind of show. You do get slightly different kinds of wrinkles when it comes to horse rump. Um, as you can see on the top one, you get some of these wrinkles here because this is the one that, that, that are kind of look more like uh, a patent leather a little bit. But then you also get some of these kind of deeper wrinkles that look a little bit more traditional to a cow leather. And you kind of see the same thing on this one right here in the same spot as well. So it's it's one of those deals that um, there will be parts that roll. There will be parts that wrinkle. Like I said, this picture should very, very clearly show the difference between the two um, and, and really let you see like how it can vary from from boot to boot, especially when your boots are made from one rump. Um, so when you take like Merriam, who makes very large horse rumps that can, you know, be upwards of 10 square feet, even up to like 13 square feet in size. I mean, you, you could see that you could end up with like an upper on one that that wrinkles just like horse strip or double horse front or even, you know, cow like Chrome XL. And then you're going to have potentially one that rolls and literally looks like Shell Cordovan. The other big misconception is Arween horse rump, as we already kind of touched on a little bit. But when when a boot builder orders horse hide from Horween, uh, a lot of times what you're what you're going to get is going to be called Horween horse hide. That's it. Um, a lot of people take that and run with it. They'll think, oh, well, it's horse hide. Oh, it must be horse rump. 
and horse romp sounds cool to everybody and everybody wants horse romp and everybody talks about how great horse romp is and all of a sudden they translate in their minds whether they know that they're doing it on purpose or whether they don't know better but they decide that they've got horse romp so they'll go out and tell everybody that they talk to that their boots are horse romp or they'll post photos on reddit or facebook or whatever and say hey i've got horse romp they don't they've got horse hide and it's actually the shoulders so it depends on who you're talking to and and what how informed they are about what they have and how they word it and sometimes you're going to have the opportunity to be able to know more than them based on what they're saying and what information they give you and other times you won't know whether they really have horse rump at all yep and, so, and, and you know, that's, that's difficult and education really isn't there yeah well and there's also a, know any yeah there, there's a huge portion of the hide that's used for other stuff too because usually it, it, it happens if it's a very good horse hide um, but most of the time boots are only made from the double horse front and the horse rump. Very rarely are they made from the rest of, of the hide that is just marketed as horse hide. Um, a lot of times that leather, which is, you know, what was between the shoulders and the hips gets turned into leather jackets. That's uh, the, a lot of times it's it. So you, you either hear the term horse hide or pony hide, and that has to, it surprisingly doesn't have anything to do with the age of the horse it has to do with the size of the hide. Um, why that's nomenclature, I have no clue. But, um, you know, you see a, a ton of high-end leather jackets made out of horse hide. Well, when they say horse hide, they're talking not about the double horse front or about the horse front. They're talking about all the bits that are in between. And that is turned into things like uh, Chrome XL horse hide, which like, companies like Arrow in the UK use a ton of. You also see A2 use in the United States. Um, and in the case of like Shinky, who's completely veg tan, their horse hide and pony hide is used in like Himmel's Brothers jackets, Field Leathers jackets. Uh, I think Arrow has used them before, but Shinky's a pain to source, so they've stopped. Um, you know, and Shinky horse hide's kind of considered the like king of leather jackets. And those are the pieces that aren't the horse rump. Like, you're not going to get Shell Cordovan in your in your shinky jacket like let me tell you the shinky's not selling that horse hide or letting that go that easy there's zero reason to um but it's interesting because you know you think horse hide like oh yeah horse hide jackets no maintenance no nothing but when it comes to boots and this is a really big misconception is on on boots uh you'll get what's called a fuzzy feel on horse hide boots and I'll bring my picture back up here. And on this left boot, you'll see just past the toe cap, this little bit that looks like a scrape um, before the kilty that's a lot lighter than everything else. And that's not actually a scrape. That is the boot getting fuzzy, telling you that it's time to condition that portion. Now, obviously, if a small piece like that's getting fuzzy, but when you can run your hand down the side of a boot and feel a large portion of the panel's fuzzy, it's time for horse to be conditioned. Which is funny because I just mentioned jackets and people are like, well, they're told not to condition your horse leather jackets for 50 or 60 years. And the answer is yes, that's correct. You're not supposed to. Because a jacket doesn't go through anywhere near the amount of flexing and force that a foot goes through in 30 years that a, a boot would go through in a year. And so because of the extra density and how much the fibers are packed and, and the, easy, the ease that the oils can work out of them, horse, especially horse rump, not so much shell, tends to need a little bit more conditioning than most leathers and it's just because you don't have that shell layer that is can be emulsified in the same amount of oils and waxes that just can you know, perpetually protrude out it will dry out it has layers that aren't that dense non-sweat pore levels of concentration that the cordovan has which a big portion of removing the grain and the flesh size or suede cut is to get rid of a lot of those problems with it. And it makes Cordovan have a very similar cross-section to something like kangaroo, which kangaroos don't have sweat glands. Kangaroo also lives in that kind of category of a leather that does not need tons of treatment and lots of conditioning. Same with Shell Cordovan. Now, your horse rump can have a lot of scratches and stuff brushed out of it like Shell. Um, but it 
I mean, you're going to condition horse rump, especially if it's a, your daily wearer, probably twice a year. It'll get fuzzy without it. And, and horse rump will lose its color, e even if it's a dyed color. It'll get like a, a washed out pastel version of itself. You'll s hit it with a little bit of, of either Corvin cream or maybe like Saphir uh, Pomadier cream, and bam, it's back to its original color in luster in seconds. But... Like I said, horse does tend to dry a little bit easier. It's just because those really dense fibers create way more friction moving over themselves, which drives oils out faster, simply. Because you're not, you're not going to run into the kind of loose grain problem you see in cow and horse. I've, I've never seen a hide with some of the like, loose grain wrinkles or like tight grain mixed in loose grain kind of nastiness that's like, you know, Chrome XL Lottery is known for this. Um, you know, we've seen it a lot, especially in the harness side of Wicket and Craig. Lots of just fat lines, loose grain, weird wrinkles. You see it a lot in uh, um, Dublin can have the same problem too, which is, makes sense because it's a similar tannish to Chrome XL. And horse doesn't have a lot of those flaws, naturally. Horse also retains a lot more strength with a, a thinner thickness. But the flip side is, is I wouldn't consider horse n nearly as reliable, and especially in extreme conditions compared to cow. And that's because of it dries out quicker. It's denser. Um, denser obviously means scratches go deeper. Denser means it's harder and stiffer. You know, denser means a, a ton of stuff in, in a negative context, where something like a looser cow, especially like wildland firefighter, it being looser, it being thicker to hold more conditioners, protectants, so on and so forth, uh, thicker for abrasion, and also the fact that since it's thicker, even though it has the same strength, it means the fibers aren't as densely packed, so they tend to stretch against abrasion a little bit more instead of something nice and hard that scratches real easy. These are some of the big differences from that perspective and like what you would see and like, you know, the idea of the was essentially re routing back to misnomer number three, and that's horse needs less maintenance than cow. And the answer is no, that's really not the case. In Shell Cordovan's case, absolutely. But Shell Cordovan's a specialty, not purely just a, you know, bog standard horse leather. Well, with the misconceptions covered and with the history and information covered, then that kind of leads you to someone probably the question of is horse really better speaking or is it more expensive because it's harder to get or because it takes more time to tan that's that's one that's something that mike just kind of started to cover there but it isn't always necessarily better and some of that price is because there's a lot less of it go around i mean for cows about half of the hides out there that are being killed for meat about half of them are going straight into the trash or landfill or i don't know what they do with them but we don't use enough leather nowadays to come close whereas with horse there's a lot less dead horse available and we're using a much larger percentage of it which means that it it's more of a commodity, so it demands more of a higher price to get it. So, I, I don't actually, I don't, I don't always reach towards horse and think, oh well, I gotta have horse. Horse is the best. There's a lot of cow or bovine leathers that I would rather have than various horse hides because they're more interesting to me or because they're going to hold up to a rougher treatment with less care. Where do you, where do you fall with that, Mike? I think horse is the best casual leather personally. That's, that's my opinion on this. I don't think there's a better casual leather than horse for the casual guy. Like if Thursday boots are your jam, horse is perfect for you. The, you need one single thing to maintain it a horse hide brush pun intended and <laughs> your cream of choice whether that's pomadier cream venetian shoe cream uh saphirs cordovan cream that's it you just need one you don't even need it in colors very rarely does a scratch in horse or shell cordovan get in deep enough that it's um, unless it's a t-core leather and even if it is a t-core leather very rarely do you need 
enough color to cover something like that up. So for most guys, just like with their Chrome XL, that, that they love the patina and the ease of maintenance, horse has a ton of those characteristics. Horse can be worked in. Now, I personally would not just due to the extra price of horse. It is very hard for me to justify someone paying the between $150 and $300 upcharge in most brands you're going to see for their horse hide, horse rump, double horse front, doesn't matter, that you're going to see in that upcharge versus cow to work in. Now, what we talked about extreme conditions earlier, but even for the regular average Joe that uh, say works at Walmart, right? Even then, the th the difference you're going to get, because you're going to get a, a, a tighter product. You're going to get a product that it's going to eventually going to mold your foot a little better, but it's also going to do its density, absorb water deeper. It's going to absorb stains deeper. It's going to, you know, uh, scratch deeper with less abrasion force required. But that doesn't mean you can't work in it. I've worked in mine. I've taken it to the data center. It's done just fine. You could work in it. I just don't know why you would at the price increase. Unless you wanted to. Like, just the answer would be purely choosing to. Because it, it, it is a, a, a pretty good upcharge compared. I mean, now once again, if we're, if we're comparing, you know, like Chrome XL to it, most places the Chrome XL upcharge is light because they order a lot of it. But in terms of a hide, you know, around... Uh, so Chrome XL is shrunken quite a bit, but, it, you know, 14 to 16 square feet is around 275 to 310 dollars depending on the specific finishing tannage and the colors because there's like cavalier chrome xl there's chrome xl um and then there, there's a couple other like interior pieces that all are in that same kind of lineup whereas a, a good large you know 13 square foot horse rump from like Merriam is going to be around 340 dollars so we're not like actually that far off in terms of price and and size the issue comes in, no one's got 300 square feet of, you know, horse rump sitting around that's going to sell as fast as, quarter, as Chrome XL does. It, this is not going to happen. So it's just an economies of scale thing. You know, they can get big enough discounts on Chrome XL by ordering large quantities and no one's going to do the large upcharges. The problem is when it comes to like, for example, Merriam horse rump, which is the main one most people go after because you can order directly from the, the tannery. Um, the only other one that you can do that without going through a distributor would be Chloe. Is you can order enough to get some good discounts, but by the time you upcharge everything you need to upcharge, you deal with the extra like, because horse is a little harder to work with than cow. And you go through it, most people upcharge their, I mean, let, let's take Wesco, for example. You know, their regular Mr. Lou's around like $750, $800. Their horse hide ones are like $950. And, and their regular ones a lot of times are made out of stuff like Chrome XL that's really not that much more expensive. Or, or that, that, that much more inexpensive, I really should say. And, and that's the difference, is, you know, you're paying for the fact that people aren't bringing it in on a regular basis. Like, the one example I'll say is, like, Truman. Truman doesn't mark up their horse rump, or the, eat their horse hide, horse rump, stuff they get from Merriam, doesn't matter what they've ran. They don't really mark it up that much compared to their traditional leathers. They, they do everything on more of a square footage-based adjustment. And, and because of that, you see a lot cheaper horse rump items coming through Truman. It's not that they're any less quality or anything. They just don't... Um, kind of command that same premium of some of the extra, you know, extraness that you deal with through some of the other manufacturers that are trying to meet their profit margins. And once again, that comes with being a ready to wear brand that is more focused on, you know, having X amount of models in stock to sell versus uh, somebody like, um, I don't want to use Wesco as an example because they do stock up their distributors decently well, but like someone like a, a White's, a Nick's, a Frank's that all have ran horse rump before or actively have horse rump and there is a much larger upcharge into getting those items I think that's it um, yep to round that point back out oh. casual wise I'd wear it you could wear it during work I wouldn't spend the upcharge for it um, but I do think everyone should own at least one pair of horse I do think there's a lot of awesome things about horse i am literally wearing a pair of horween bourbon show cordovan monkey boots right now so like obviously i'm on the horse train um 
you know, I've got a, a pair of Merriam Black horse right there. Uh, those happen to be natural Chrome XL and Battle Assey Pueblo. Um, but everyone should own horse. I, I do agree, uh, or I, I do stand behind that statement, I should say. But I don't think people should seek out horse first. Horse is not as easy to size. Horse does not stretch, so you cannot get the wrong size in it. It is way less forgiving. And uh, there are some choices that you will make in horse that you will absolutely regret you would never think twice with a cow. Like lining lots of patches over themselves. <laughs> so. We did see in the past, um, I guess I could use diesel fuel as an example. I mean, if, if we go far enough back in time, 10 years, we can remember when diesel fuel was a whole lot less than gasoline. And part of that reason was because not as much of it was being used uh, and, and the way that the refinering uh, occurs. But in the same way, horse used to be pretty cheap. I mean, if you went out, if you were buying a pair of, say, engineers like 40 years ago, you could buy a pair of horse for really cheap. Why? Because nobody wanted to eat horse. I mean, I mean, nobody wanted to wear horse any more than they wanted to eat horse. And so there was a lot of hides. So the hides were cheap. So they were able to make it into boots reasonably cheap. So you actually could, at that point in time, find a horse hide boot for pretty cheap. So bring that around to now when it's more demand, which was my point a few minutes ago. Is, is it necessarily better for what you're doing or is it because it's, it's higher demand, lower lower amount available? Yeah, and the answer, for work is, the answer for work is no. There's nothing about horses better than cow in any way for work. For casual, it depends on how you use your boots. I mean, the horse boots will, if they're sized properly, they'll fit better. They mold to your foot better. They are in most cases a little bit more comfortable they don't deal with the same like kind of pushing down on your foot with the folds and wrinkles you get in cow that kind of fight against you as much and in general most people agree that horse looks better especially with patina but you pay for that there's 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 a price to play you know no one gets into car tuning without realizing they need 25 grand available at all times it should last longer as well yeah, if it's taken I mean, care of that, that could be I could certainly if you bought one at a younger age you you might be able to wear it your whole life if your foot didn't grow whereas you wouldn't be able to get that kind of time out of a cow if you had bought a cow at that point yep. all right yeah I think Is that I, it I think that's it our shortest shortest one yet 48 uh, minutes getting close i don't know if it's quite <laughs> the shortest but it's around there anyway like comment subscribe if you have any questions leave them down in the comments below hopefully we covered we've had some comments about horse so hopefully this we, we try our best to explain it then hopefully this covered anything we're missing and for anyone that was kind of curious about the differences um you know here it is this is most of the relevant information that's needed on horse and you know I think the answer everyone came to is if you want a factually correct 1940s boot, horse is the answer. And I am tabulating these questions, putting a bunch of them together. There will be, there might be two Q&A episodes by the time it's all said and done. Probably got one complete already with all the questions, but keep on asking them and we're definitely going to get to them. Cheers. Enjoy, everybody. All right. Sancha.